Hey, everybody, welcome to Live from the Ranch. A very good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. This is Live from the Ranch. My name is Ken Ramirez, and uh, my co-host today, like every other month, is Juliana de Willems. Hi, Juliana, how are you doing today? Hey, Ken. I'm, I'm great. If we want to break the fourth wall, we can tell everyone I just hopped on <laughs> about 45 seconds ago. So I'm good. I'm here. That's what matters. <laughs> and, 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 you know, it's interesting because I wasn't worried. I just said, you know, she'll be here. I know she will. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm much more panicked when one of our guests is, is, is not here on time. And, and of course, our guest today is Laura Monica Torelli. I'll introduce her in just a second. But she she's been here for uh, in plenty of time. So she's queued up and ready to go. So how have you been? I've Since we had Expo and then we have, right after Expo, we had a, another live from the ranch. And then now we've had a, a gap of time since I've, since I've seen you last. So are you doing well? Yeah. Yes, it feels so funny not seeing you for so long and not doing the ranch for this like five week window that we have. <laughs> but it's just holding me over until I see you in person in uh, Portland. Yes, right. We've got Clicker Expo coming up really soon. So I'm really excited about having uh, Laura back on for the for today. This is, I think, her fourth time being on Live from the Ranch, and she always has wonderful things to share. So I'm just going to go ahead and, and introduce her. Uh, she is the founder of Animal Behavior Training Concepts in Chicago, Illinois. She began her career in 1991 at Chicago's Shedd Aquarium, and there she trained a variety of marine mammals. And after about a decade at the aquarium, she went to the San Diego Zoo. And then from there, we went to the Brookfield Zoo and became a lead supervisory trainer there. During her time in the zoological community, she worked with everything from marine mammals to primates, large cats, birds of prey, horses, parrots, tree kangaroos, giraffes, red pandas, and of course, dogs. And she was also a part of the wildlife rescue and rehabilitation team at the Wildlife Discovery Center in Lake Forest, Illinois. Laura is a Karen Pryor Academy KPA faculty member, as well as a teaching assistant for Dr. Susan Friedman's Living and Learning with Animals online course. Laura has presented at a lot of professional conferences and taught seminars all over the world. She's been an invited speaker at the American Veterinary Medical Association Convention, the Midwest Veterinary Conference, the Penn Vet Working Dog Conference, and of course, she's been a regular speaker for us at Clicker Expo. She's part of our faculty on the Clicker Expo team. She's appeared a lot on various broadcast media. She appears on local TV in Chicago all the time talking about training and taking care of your pets. Uh, she's contributed to training videos for the Fear Free Professional Trainer Certification Program and for our own Karen Pryor Academy Better Veterinary Visits online class. So without further ado, hi, Laura, how are you? Welcome to Live from the Ranch. How are you doing? I'm so good. It's so good to be back. Thank you for the generous invitation to return. Um, I'm, I'm just so excited to partner up with you again and spend time with you and Juliana. Thank you. Well, good. So I just want to remind everybody who's watching that if you have questions about anything that you see Lara, uh, Laura talking about or Laura or me demonstrating today, don't hesitate to ask questions in the chat window. Juliana is going to be keeping track of those. And when it comes time to uh, answer those questions, uh, uh, Juliana will join us and we'll get a chance to listen in. Um, so, Laura, we're going to talk a little bit about medical training. It seems like that's what we talk about a lot when you're on the program. And um, I think it's it's interesting because while both of us have come from a zoological environment where training for medical needs was normal and commonplace, it is interesting to me to see that in the dog world, that often isn't the case unless they've been exposed to it through a course like the ones that you do or ones that I do. Um, what do you constantly find when, when people are asking about training their dogs for, for medical training? Do you find them surprised that that's even possible? Or is it like something that they hadn't even considered ever doing until they hear you talk about it? Um, you know, su such a good question. And I would say both. In fact, I was thinking about this last night about um, it's been 17 years since I launched what I just call my Ready, Set for Groomer and Vet program, 17 years. And you've heard me say before, I know I'm not the first person to come up with the concept of weaving in vet and grooming care into our dog's everyday care. You know, I think about other great trainers who've been talking about it. You know, 
you know, I, I always refer to Kathy Sadeo's blog from like 2004, where she was integrating it into her group classes. Um, and I just circle back to my clients. What I learned from you is when I was a young brain mammal trainer was this is part of everyday care. It's not a specialty behavior, but what I have learned over the years is what I learned from my clients, which could be um, maybe it wasn't on their radar because they're scared to do it. They've tried to clean their dog's ears and maybe their dog ran and hid from them. So they felt that their dog's response was detrimental to their relationship or on the other side of the spectrum. And, and maybe you, you know, you hear this from, from private dog um, caregivers too, is in their mind, it's compartmentalized. Like vets do vet things. Groomers do groomer things. The dog walker does dog walker things. So it's not on their radar to maybe, you know, check their paws a couple times a week, maybe do a paw soak before their dogs need a paw soak. It's just not on their radar. Right. And I think that's a good, a, a good point. I think sometimes when you start thinking about medical behaviors, the first thing some people think about is really invasive stuff like sticking a needle in and taking blood. And while that certainly is, except in rare occasions, something that is probably going to be reserved for the vet or the vet veterinary technician, there are so many other things that we can do with our pets to help them be comfortable touching their face, touching their ears, touching their paws and doing things like that, that sometimes people just forget that that's a part of medical training. And you're just sort of touching your animal all over and getting them comfortable to use sensations, right? Well, and you know, that's, that's a great bridge to, you know, if our dogs seek tactile, if they are physically um, looking for that type of interaction with us, we are touching them all over all the time. It's just in our mind, it might be a picture of different conditions. Like we're cuddling on the couch. Um, I'm putting on their collar and harness, but our movements are still part of the hands are getting close to the ears. The hands are getting close to the eyes. The hands are getting close to maybe some coat care needs. So all of this continuum of the stimuli of our body coming back and forth to our dogs to me is the joy of fine slicing these behaviors to, you know, this, this is all part of the care. Why don't we break down what you're comfortable doing as the handler and what your dog is comfortable doing. Everyone is safe. No one's going to get hurt and always consulting the vet, always yeah. consulting our vet team. Absolutely. And, and it's probably important that we state that right off the bat. You and I are going to talk about a lot of things that we as trainers can do to work with our dogs and work with our pets to accomplish a lot. But neither you nor I ever do anything without checking and making sure that our veterinarian approves, that our veterinarian feels that that's the right approach. I actually just had my uh, my most recent veterinary exam for Marlin just took place last week. And um one of the things that uh, that dawned on me, and I knew we were doing this episode, and it dawned on me, she prescribed a, a medication but late at night as Marlon's gotten older, he tends to cough up and sort of regurgitate food and and she she felt like there was a, a medication that he could give that he could take that would help him. And what was interesting for me is it I didn't bat an eye. I thought, oh, give it a medication, that's not hard. But I realized that is something that can be difficult for some people. And it's one of those things that you may say, I'm not a veterinarian. I will never have to do medical procedures. But clearly, if the veterinarian prescribes a, a 10 day dosage of some antibiotic or some other treatment that you have to give the dog, they're going to be expecting you to do that. And uh, and fortunately for me, I've trained Marlon years ago to to take medication in a variety of ways uh, you and I used to work with uh, sea otters where we would grind up all the squid and mix in stuff with the squid and give it to them in a syringe and i do something very similar here with my donkeys i use applesauce and mix stuff in and give it to the donkeys but um it's a. Uh, but I, I, I've seen, watched you on Instagram recently talking about uh, your dog Vito needing to get special medication. And tell us a little bit about how you manage that with him and tell us a little bit about the background of that. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, Vito, um, we are ruling out um, different considerations where he gets these flare-ups, where he gets um, 
flare ups in his foot pads and his ears. And our vet is, you know, we're, we're doing a least invasive approach first to see if he has food allergies. Um, and so Vito isn't as a voracious eater as our dog Santino was. Like Santino never missed a meal his whole life. Um, Vito's always been selective and his response, you know, it's kind of like I'm running in the back of my head, like, what would I do if you were a sea otter? Um, because I do vividly remember how much I've learned from the sea otters at Shed Aquarium through your coaching. Um, and so our vet did prescribe um, prescription food. And I asked our vet, uh, and this just started um, a couple weeks ago, and I asked our vet, does it come in wet and like in canned food? And uh, Dr. Osborne from West Loop Vet Care, who's amazing, said yes. And I said, do I have your permission to put the food in these dog bake molds? I'm holding up two of them now, but in these dog bake molds, and they come in itty bitty ones. I found these on Amazon um, to bake them and dry them out and feed them as his treats. And she said yes. And so here's what they look like when it's all said and done and baked out of the out of the wet food when I put it in the oven. And as you said, this is there's just a short video on my Instagram page. But Vito being ever so curious about what we're gonna offer him, um, I did also take his prescription dry treats and I cracked them in small pieces. So not not a favorite and these are his duck treats that we have to fade out he loves these play-doh brand duck treats loves them so i mix these together and i offer him um you know first i'll start with a duck treat he swallows it and then i'll offer a dry treat prescription treat he swallows it then i'll drop the baked treat and he swallows it and i'm reinforcing him i'm reinforcing the behavior of eating the less preferred food with a higher value food, like what I learned with the sea otters. Right. Yeah, that's great. In fact, I, I would love to show the this video you posted on Instagram a while back. It, if you came in in the middle of this, it would look like we were watching some baking show or something. Uh, but uh, um, but let's let's play that first video and maybe you can describe what it is you're doing. Uh, I think you have some titles on it that you put on, on Instagram when 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 it when it was there. But this is uh, you preparing the treats for Vito that have the medication in them. Um, all right. I just want to stop you there for a second. We had a technical glitch and we all got to see the video, but I saw, I know your lips were moving the entire time that video was playing, but we didn't hear a word that you said. So why don't you talk a little bit about the video? We just saw the video played really, really well. And I, I had asked the question at the time, did you know from the start that it was going to be okay to bake these, these treats? Or that was one of the things that you checked in with your veterinarian before you started? Yes, yes. I sent, um, um, uh, I actually called the vet clinic, West Loop Vet Care, and asked, um, asked the front desk staff to consult with Dr. Osborne um, with what my plans were and if Dr. Osborne approved that I could bake the prescription canned food. And Dr. Osborne said, yes, it's perfectly fine. Baking it doesn't change the nutritional composition. 
Yeah, and I think those are always the important things. I've I've had various types of medications. Sometimes you want to crush it up, and sometimes vets will go, no, don't do that. It needs to stay complete for this reason or that reason. So it's really helpful uh, to know. But but clearly, this worked out well, and, and, and did Vito show any hesitation to eating these treats when you first gave them to them? Did you have to approximate them to, to, to eating them? Yes, particularly um, so far, the baked wet food treats a hit. He has not refused it once. And my husband reports that he hasn't refused it when he offers it. It's these, and maybe some of our guests noticed too, but it's these hard, crunchy, dry prescription treats. And that if anything, he will just walk away from it. Um, and I always think about uh, how the sea otters would take the food item and they would pretend to pocket it and it would float away. And then they'd go like this, like, do you, have, do you have something else? And that was so cute. And we're like, I see, I see that floating away at the surface of the water to the skimmer. So what we've done here is thankfully these crack nice and tiny. And so I'll put, I'll put these inside the wet food and I make a meatball. And so other tips that I've given some of um, my virtual or in-person collaborations is with bed approval, teach your pup before they need it that different textures in their mouth um, can have good outcomes. So if, if they get like peas and you cook up the peas and you cool them or Cheerios or a little piece of a hard carrot, we don't want them to choke or a little piece of an apple, the concept of chewing down on something and then being right there to reinforce it as a behavior. But yes, so that, Vito yeah. definitely had a, a discerning taste and yeah. response. Yeah, I think I think even the 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 most meticulous of traders have found themselves in situations where you thought you'd prepared your animal well for this unusual taste or this different sensation, and and turns out that, that they 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 weren't have, they didn't want to have anything to do with it. So you have to really really work hard at it. I know that for us, with a lot of our donkeys, we use as I said, applesauce. And whenever we mix anything else in with the applesauce, we have to have a second syringe ready with the pure applesauce. So if they take a little bit of the salty flavor, or the unusual flavor of, of the medication, I can follow it up with the, the pure applesauce. So they go, oh yeah, this is what I really, really like. And that really helps build that up for them. And then I think on the other end of the spectrum, do I have time to share the Cree story and its relation to sure. dog owners? Sure. Um, so, um, you know, I'm like, I'm like many other dog caregivers. I, I worry if, if my dog or my cats um, are not eating um, per particularly what's been prescribed for them because I'm worried that they're not getting the full medical and nutritional support as well. But I've also seen it happen with dog caregivers that their dog spits out the least favored food item that they're really were hoping to get into them by reinforcing it with something that the dog really wants. So inadvertently, their dog is learning, if I refuse to eat this, you're going to give me what I really like because you want me to eat. And so I was sharing with, um, just for our guests, I was sharing with Ken a story, and this is 30 years ago now. Um, this had to be like 1992. I was, I was a young trainer and I was out on a session working with Cree, uh, one of the Pacific white-sided dolphins. And during, during the training session, she kept spitting out fish. And then I would reach in the um, the food bucket and I'd offer a different fish and she'd swallow it. And I wasn't really paying close attention to what she was teaching me. So after the session, I went right to Ken's office. I went, I went right to your office, Ken, and I said, Ken, I think we need to call the vet team. Something's wrong with Cree. She's not eating consistently. And you said, we are the eyes and ears for the vet. So I'm letting you know. And, and you were like immediately like, oh, really? Well, why don't we do a a quick mini session. Let's round up a few of the trainers. Let's all go out again. And you stood and you watched what I was doing. Do you want to share what you saw? Or do you want me to finish the story? You go ahead and finish the story. I'm still laughing. It's so vivid, but it made such an impression. So what was happening was I was offering Cree, um, um, I think it was smelt or capelin, which she didn't like. It, let me rephrase that. Not her number one favorite uh, food right. item. So she'd spit it out, but I was inadvertently giving her a herring right after that, and Cree loved herring. And then I'd give her a smelt or a capelin, and it would, she would be like, no, 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 and it would float away, and I'd be like, here's a herring. So basically, 
Creed taught me that if she spits out what she doesn't like, I'm going to give her the herring anyway, which she really likes. So lesson learned, animals are great teachers. They, they certainly are. And, uh, but you got it back on track pretty quickly once you realized what was happening there. Hey, let's, let's, let's switch for a minute to another topic. And, and, and I wanted to uh, um, show a little bit about uh, foot soap behavior that you've been working on. Um, and that was, uh, tell us a little bit about why you needed to teach Vito to soak his, his paws. Yeah, yeah. So um, our sweet Vito, as I mentioned earlier, has some skin sensitivities that flare up every now and then. And while our vet team is trying to parse out what that cause might be, um, over the years, he's required a dilute Novacian solution. So I'm holding up the bottle now, but we do a couple tablespoons of this um, in a bin with some lukewarm water. And the treatment protocol is to soak the paw for five minutes once a day. And so to build up that game, I've been playing lots of different iterations and approximations of put your paws on this and put your paws in this, and then slowly built up the concept of moisture around his paws. Um, yeah. Well, good. So let's, hey, you know what? I'm going to uh, skip the next video we were going to show it with, with Vito just eating the, the baked goods because we already saw a little bit of that in the first video. And we're going to go to the third video now that we provided, which is of you doing an actual foot soak with Vito. Uh, and you can, it's in a small little uh, container and you've got the chlorhexidine in there. Um, I'm not sure if we're going to be able to get your mic working. If not, we'll just watch it and then we'll talk about it after we see it. Let's go okay. ahead and play it. Okay, sounds good. Oh, that was great. Um, um, tell you what, I, what I want to do is I want to take a quick break and tell everybody about some events coming up here in the Karen Pryor Clicker Training World. And then we'll come back and we'll talk about that. And maybe you could help coach me through teaching that with Marlon. I, Marlon learns quickly, but he's never done any kind of foot soak before. So let's let's do that here in about a minute. OK, Laura? Oh, and, that sounds great. All right, good. I uh, love that video. But in the meantime, uh, I want to tell you all that if you're an animal training professional or just a training enthusiast, we've got some great events coming up here in the next uh, couple of months. Our three-day in-person conference clicker expo that Juliana and I were talking about at the top of the hour is going to be taking place in Portland, Oregon, April 5th, 6th, and 7th. Laura's going to be there. Juliana will be there. I'll be there. We have lots of wonderful speakers. We hope you'll join us there and uh our season here at the ranch here in graham washington right here in the foothills of mount rainier we kick off our 2024 season in april and we have courses every single month so i'm hoping that you'll join us for one of those courses and if you want to find out more just go to clickertraining.com and you can find out more about our ranch courses and you can of course find out more about clicker expo all right laura let's uh, let's chat a little bit more and uh first of all um i was curious as you were teaching that or, or doing that with Vito. Did he have any aversion to putting his foot in the water or was that an easy uh, process for him? Um, he would avoid it when he was younger. Um, and just for the sheer fact of, of submerging it for so long, 
when his paw flare-ups do happen, his paws are pretty swollen. And so when he does put his paw in immediately and he kind of retracts, I definitely give him that choice. And I'm, you know, like get your balance, get comfortable. But then I swing back to some of the games that you and I are going to practice with. I know that you couldn't hear the audio on the video, but I was also um, demonstrating um, a, a what's called a stimulus stimulus response pairing. Um, I also talk about a stimulus response pairing, but I would say the verbal cue lift and then feed. And then I would say lift. And then I would do the second stimulus of touching his leg. Um, and it's, it's the nuance of what our dogs offer in between the stimulus stimulus pairing that's gold. So when I say lift, and I'm not moving, but if I say lift and he runs away, that's information to me that the other pairing of following it with whatever the touch gradient might be, starting where he likes being touched down to the foot, needs a bit more attention. And so I really appreciate the dialogue and that information that I get back and forth from him. But he's no, definitely I more hesitant when there's a flare up. Well, that makes sense. Yeah. And um, how often do you have to, to soak his feet like that? With the actual chlorhexidine, I only have to soak it when there is a flare up. So we average about maybe once or twice a month. And usually, thankfully, it's been a one off one paw, not all four or two at the same time. But I still man, um, I still build up a reinforcement history around mocking up the behavior probably right. at least five times a week. Well, that's good. That's good. Well, you know, one of the things that, that I wanted to talk a little bit about is I'm switching my camera right here is that um, I know that you do a lot of online coaching, right, Laura? And 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 I thought maybe this would be a great opportunity. I'm sorry, I'm messing with my camera here just to make sure it's working. I'm going to call Marlon in here and maybe you can give me some thoughts about how you would go about teaching this particular behavior. Does that sound good? Sounds good. Sounds good. Okay. Let me know when you're ready for some coaching. Marlon, come on in. I'm going to get Marlon from the other room. He's unwinding his old body from uh, from a laying position. Well, you bring, up a great, you bring up a great point, letting him warm up and stretch nice and slow. Ken, yeah. do, you prefer, do you prefer live coaching second to second while you're working with him? Or do you want me to offer up a couple tips, stop talking, you do a couple click points and then we review together. What's your- Yeah, I, I think it just depends on how complex your instructions are. If you give the really complex instructions, I probably wanna focus on what I'm doing and then you can give me feedback after. But at the okay. same time, I don't mind hearing uh, comments if you think things are, are going poorly or you ne I need to make some adjustments. Don't hesitate to let me I know. I think things are gonna go poorly, but um, so um, just for our guests to know before we went live, I did ask Ken if Marlon has any underlying medical concerns, structural sensitivities, lameness. Um, so Ken and I did, did, did get a chance to touch base. Um, Ken, when we work on introducing a prop for him to put a front paw or two um, in, these, um, in these foot bath goals, do you predict he's going to want to sit because it's more comfortable or is he comfortable standing for duration to rock body weight forward? He's going to be more comfortable sitting. He will go into a sit position most of the time. But if if I cue him to come toward me, he'll get up and walk toward me. But he'll his tendency is to default into a sit position. OK, so one of the things I'm going to show is, um, Ken, I'm holding up the rubber prop that's in the other video that I sent you for our guests to see. Right. But what I recommend is this is just a little dog rubber mat that catches Vito's water and it's got a little lip on it. And what I do is I use this and I put a towel over it to introduce the concept of paws going in a shallow tray that won't slip under the dog and won't slip on the surface that we're training. So it looks like Ken is all set up and Ken, you've got two of those, right? I do. They're awesome. different sizes, but I do have two of them. Okay. How do you feel about setting them flat on the ground, distance from one another, and then setting a towel inside each of them if you've got two <laughs> towels? You have plenty of room for you and Marlon to move around and use up that real estate. All right. Hold towel over this one. He's and already stepping in it. Now. Click and treat. So good. So, Ken, I'm going to let you do your 
do your thing and capture and shape what he offers going on. All right, there's two feet on that one. Lovely. Come on over here, buddy. And why don't you, perfect, why don't you feed in position, click, feed in position, good, his front paws are in it. Slowly put a treat behind you by that plastic bowl. Slowly show him the reset right by behind you. Oh, oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, behind by your left shoe. So he sees it. Now move over to the other other tray and meet him over there with a the click point right now. Beautiful. Now place the treat by your right foot so he can see it easily. He doesn't twerk his body for a reset and maybe twinge a muscle. Now put the treat by your other foot so he sees it and meet him over at the other platform. Okay. Good. So we're going to use movement as a reinforcer. Click and feed. Now tell him all done. Big boy. Give that sweet, oh, he's just such an older gentleman dog. Look at that sweet. That's nature sugar on his face, isn't it? <laughs> it is. Now, do you have water in that Tupperware bowl ready? I have water ready if you need it, yes. Do you think he would be ready for you to sprinkle a little bit of water on each of those towels or maybe just one towel? Yeah, let's try some. Let me just do a little bit. Get ready to Not feed my... him as he watches you. Just a little sprinkle. Yeah, a little dash. You could do a little bit more. And in the video I sent you with Vito, he was actually drinking up. He was licking the water on the towel. I don't think Marlon will do that, but there's a, there's some right there. Good. And All let's right. do, Good. let's ping pong back and forth between the mats. Hey, buddy. Good boy. You want to come over here? Good. Ken, this is great. Nice. Two more click right. points, one at each mat. I'm this is the only one that's wet. This one over here is not wet. Which I really appreciate. We're going to approximate that. And then there. tell him whatever his cue is all done. He's the best dog. And then let's put more water. He is the best dog. He um, is. Okay. He is. So you slowly saturate it a little bit more and give him a treat for watching. I love how he's watching you. Like, what are you doing now? <laughs> he, he is very curious about what the heck I'm doing there. Would you describe his body language as relaxed and affiliative or nervous? Yes, he's very relaxed. Good. All right, let's end the soak there. Okay. Dab the towel down a little bit so we don't get any slippage. And another treat for your boys supervising so nicely. And this is the concept of introducing different stimuli of moisture and then okay. varying duration. Shall I bring him on? Yep. Okay. Hey, buddy, come on over here. <laughs> he he definitely moved away. Now meet him at the dry mat. Meet him Take at the other I really, I really appreciate that you still clicked and treated him. Click come over here. His approach. Yeah, take that. Now put the treat. Put the treat where? Put the treat behind <laughs> you while he gets it. Step across that mat and click as he approaches right now. Good. And then go ahead and do a treat toss behind you by that plastic bin. Meet him at the dry one. Hi, buddy. And then what we're going to do here is click, toss a couple treats behind you by your globe, that really neat globe. And then take that flat tray with the water and line it up parallel to the dry tray. Click and treat him for watching. Good. And do your game of just varying food placement while you move around. And you're going to meet him at different locations, capture and shape him for Good. stepping on either tray. Good. Can I come over here? Perfect. Three more over. click points and let's have a post-session review. 
Love oh, it. Boy. I really like how you're moving him across it so the back paws might get a little bit of introduction to the wet. Wait, one more. Come on here, buddy. And then toss a reset behind you, pick up the dry towel and mat, but then place the dry towel over the wet towel and mat without the added tray. And get capture and shape any approximations under that dry towel. Okay. Hi, buddy. Good. Give him a quick and treat. There you go. That's our end point. We're done. So what I was coaching there was less, um, less intensity of the wet. Look at him. He's like, I'm just going to stand on it now because he taught us a lot that maybe that was too much water too quick, which is a great lesson for us to learn. So I'm like, well, let's make it less moist by putting the dry towel over it. And the fact that he was able to step back on it was good news. So yeah, anyway. that was, that was good. Um, I also really appreciate your coaching style because it was very, it was very easy for me to follow. And, uh, and once, once, once I realized how you were going to coach, I thought, oh, I'm just going to wait and you're going to guide me through the process. And that took all the thinking off of my head for the most part. <laughs> and, and I allowed you to do the thinking, but it was good. And then once I understood what you were aiming for, then I was able to follow up with that on my own. So I thought that was good. And he definitely got better. Um, I did put too much water on that second time. It was clearly a, a too big of an approximation, but like you said, it's a lesson learned. Yeah, it is. And, and that's training in real life. Like if it, if it was always easy and there were no, um, approximations for us to revisit and we weren't looking at the dialogue from our learner, no one would need help. <laughs> so, you know, right, um, right, right. what I also want to share too is um, I do try to make it a point to ask each, whether in person or virtual, that question of how, you know, what is your preference for coaching? Do you want it where I'm coaching you and you've got your animal in front of you, or is that too much? And you and I can have a plan. You maybe practice it without your animal, then your animal, and then we revisit it. And I talk, and you and I talk after. So, you know, that's a very personal learning style for each person. Right. Um, yes. No, that's that's a really valuable thing that I think uh, is great uh, uh, about being a good coach, which you are, is finding out how, how the learner wants to receive feedback, which I, which I very, very much appreciated. You know what I'd love to do is let's take another quick break, Laura. <laughs> and then when we come back, I'll have uh, Juliana join us just to talk about the session and to talk a little bit about this, this process of online learning that we just went through and, and, and talk about some of the benefits and, and, and challenges of that. So we'll be right back in just a minute as I wanna tell everybody a little bit about uh, Karen Pryor Academy. You know, we take a very innovative approach to developing and supporting outstanding positive reinforcement trainers. With KPA, you can build your skills and knowledge by enrolling in any of our preparatory courses, or if you already have some experience, you can apply to our professional certification program. You can check out our 20 plus upcoming series, including Melbourne, Australia, Dublin, East Bay, California. We've got one in Washington, DC. And of course, we have our brand new fully online virtual format. Find a series that works for you and your schedule and learn more about it at KarenPriorAcademy.com. So I think our, 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 our dog trainer professional program is, is really a wonderful program. But I thought, Let's bring both uh, Laura and Juliana back onto the screen, because first, I want to talk about online learning a little bit and talk a little bit about our brand new virtual version of the uh, DTP. But first, let's just talk a little bit about that session. And, and what I'm always fascinated by is I'm not sure if prior to COVID, many people had experienced online coaching. Now I, because I have consulted with zoos and aquariums and often have worked with zoos around the globe, have often consulted by having a trainer show me what they're doing on a video and then I give them feedback. But 
I've really found that online coaching sometimes allows me to see it more clearly, to give better feedback. I'm curious as to what the two of you of what you found about the, the benefits of online coaching. Laura, Juliana, share with me your thoughts about that. Um, I certainly, one of the biggest benefits is that is how much it basically forces the guardian themselves to do the training that I can't just right. like grab the leash, get the dog started and then pass it back. I really, they have to do it from start to finish, build behaviors a hundred percent. And therefore they feel more empowered long-term to continue the training well past our time together. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that's it, it, it. You just don't have the option of showing it for them. I mean, you could potentially, if Laura had her dog with her, she could say, hey, let me demonstrate for you with her dog. But she's not going to be able to train my dog if she's just uh, over the airwaves like that. Um, do you do a lot of online coaching like that, Laura? Is that something that's a normal part of your everyday business? Or was it has that just grown since COVID? Or has it always been a part of your teaching? Um, it, it is it was not a normal part of, of my teaching pre COVID. And since COVID, it is definitely in my own business and through Karen Pryor Academy, um, the bulk of what I do, which is so neat because I get to meet people across the world. I've got, I've got teams that I'm collaborating with from Australia, from the UK, from, you know, from all over and, you know, lucky me. What I also, Besides that global reach and and building collaborations that way, um, just to stem off of Juliana's great point about a benefit is also getting to work with a dog or other species. Sometimes they help with other species as well and their handler in the very environment that they, that they, whether it's the handlers and the animals feel most comfortable in. And for some of some of my private client teams, loading up their dog and driving to a group class or driving to a workshop environment might be um, too stressful for them and their dog. There's just too many stimuli that will set their animal into motion of, of you know, not wanting to participate, um, not wanting to eat, and just being so scared that they don't even want to come out of the car. Um, and it also sets up a really great success point of sharing videos in the way that I did with you, Ken. So when I'm teaching virtually, sometimes I can have Vito here for a live demo. Sometimes I use, um, sometimes Topolina and Lucia, my cats want to help with the live demos. But the cool thing is, is I'll say, you know what? I've got this great video. I'm going to airdrop it right now because I just thought of it. And it airdrops in seconds and I can show my virtual team um, another team per their permission. Like I, everyone's approving these videos to be shared or a vet approval video to say, this is what I'm trying to articulate could be a next goal for us. Watch this video and they can see in real time what other folks might be struggling with worldwide and say, oh, I'm not alone in this. That's been a benefit. You know, before we go too deep down a rabbit hole talking just about virtual learning, I just wanted to double check in with Juliana and see if there were any questions about some of the husbandry tips that Laura was sharing. And if there were any questions or comments about uh, her videos or, or, or the training session that I did. So I have a question about the training session. At what point in a training when you're doing kind of exploratory training, do you have to worry about actually accidentally shaping avoidance behaviors? Like I think Marlon very quickly could have learned to go around the towel. And so at what point do you keep push, not pushing, but like, do you keep going and saying like, okay, what else can we get from him versus like, okay, oops, the wrong behavior that we're looking for that we're not looking for is evolving out of this. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for asking that. And I think one way that I might rephrase it is I wouldn't so much look at it as a wrong behavior as it is as information that there's so much right and there's so much good. Um, and thank you for thank you, Ken, for letting me live coach you because I wasn't nervous at all. Not one bit. Um, but <laughs> but, you know, I thought I really thought the, 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 the point that she's asking about was a good one, because once Marlon learned that that one particular tray had cold water at it and understand he is a lab who loves to jump in the water yeah. 
but the feeling of that cold water on his paws was obviously different and he was avoiding that particular tray every time i thought your suggestion of taking the other tray away and taking the dry towel and putting it over that same one was a brilliant idea because what it did it allowed him to see that that one location did not always have that unusual sensation so i thought that was a good way to oh thank you to yeah. deal with that thank you and it's not that the word you know I don't, I don't look at the word avoid as being detrimental. Let me rephrase my answer um, to Juliana's great question. Avoidance to me doesn't necessarily mean detrimental, but that's where I would ask the handlers, you know, um, you know your dog best. How would you describe their body language in real time with you in front of them? Is your dog, you know, are they trembling? Are they quietly whining coupled with avoidance or could there be a loop of the dog learning? I'm going to go around and still get fed. I'm going to go around and still get fed. Um, and the initial information that Marlon gave us when Ken really saturated that one towel and he stepped on it and he went, what? And his paw went up. It was such an elegant moment because, you know, we know reinforcement comes, comes from the environment more than just food. And so Marlon's immediate ability to get away from that tray, immediate reinforcement for him. So great job for Ken to give Marlon that autonomy, that that space to say, I need to back away from this versus Ken, you know, having him on leash and pulling him on the mat or not giving him a way out, which some some dog caregivers might think that is the only way to go. You know, I need to, I need to get this done. You have no way out. And then a dog's behavior escalates to, you know, growling or biting. And so Marlon's response was so valuable to us. And then to see the recovery time with Ken's great high rate of reinforcement and moving around that room, right? Using up that real estate helped us get back on track too. I don't know if I answered the question, Juliana. Did I? Really? Okay. No, you did. I think you did. But I have another question for you. And this is partly a question about online versus in person. Were you able to tell online by watching through video, oh my goodness, Ken, that's too much water? Or would that have been something you would have been more easily able to see in person? And 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 would you normally have interrupted if you felt like, oh, that's enough? <laughs> Gosh, you know, woulda, coulda, shoulda. Um, the, the initial sprinkle that you did was what I love about fine slicing is I, I, I would do a much slower introduction of water, sure. but you also mentioned, oh, Marlon loves water. He's a water dog, you know, so for the average pet caregiver, they might go, I'm not anticipating a problem whatsoever. My dog loves water. I'm going to do a little bit more. And then under the context of, and this is where I, you know, I think part of you know, being an empathetic caregiver and being an empathetic training professional is quickly changing what we're doing to say, maybe it was a little too much. So let's quickly pivot right. and go in this direction. What I would also right. suggest too, because, you know, this, this is, you know, live, a live, um, a live broadcast and maybe the approximations would have been a bit more than we would have done um, in any other scenario was also keeping in mind, you know, if Marlon loves access to the backyard, doing an approximation or two, and then giving more space as a reinforcer and saying, let's go run in the deck, let's go in the backyard, or maybe bringing the trays to the backyard, maybe taking these activities outside on your property where he's like, I'm in the lake and I'm jumping in the water and now we got the trays out and you're doing this over here. So that's, that's the neat thing about the information I get back from my virtual teams about how you integrate these tips in real time when we're done. Yeah, and, and I would say very clearly that the feeling of a wet towel on your paw isn't related to water at all as far as the dog is concerned. In other words, jumping into a big lake of water and touching your paw to a cold towel, I think about the fact I love swimming. But if someone came behind me and I has, didn't have a shirt on and they touched my back with a cold washcloth, I would be startled and scared and just going, Whoa, what was that? It, it doesn't even feel like the same thing. I think you have to look at it from the dog's perspective and realize this, this doesn't feel like water at all. It's just a cold, weird thing I'm stepping on. Which could also be another consideration about, you know, the temperature of the water is also something yeah. that might not be on other caregivers 
radar as well. You know, so this is where yeah. um, it's all just such helpful information. Juliana, were there any other questions that came up from anybody or, or, or was that it for the questions about husbandry and the medical stuff that we were trading? It looks like there's one question about the start of the session. Marlon, like you said, got up and and uncoiled himself into that nice big stretch, which I think set him up really well to be engaged and eager in the training. Right. Canine Pied Piper asks, I have my younger dog always do that, a really big stretch, but my other dog never does. So is that something that you can teach a dog to do? I'll let Laura answer that one. Um, She's our guest. Oh, well, um, for my dogs, when when they first come in our, in our lives, um, when they get up from a nap or they come out um, in like from their crate, um, when they're being crate trained as young puppies, or if they're in their kitty pen, they would typically get up and stretch and just kind of, you know, do a nice stretch under those conditions. Um, and I would, I would capture and shape that nice stretch behavior by doing a tongue click or saying click offering food. And then they would quickly learn as puppies when they would come out off of their dog bed, off of a nap, they would look at me or my husband and go like this and they would play bow and stretch. And they're like, this is what got me food last time. And then we would add a cue and which for us is a curtsy. So when they would be reliably stretching, we would insert that curtsy cue. Um, and so, yeah, definitely, you know, if your dog enjoys the stretch, capture it, add food, um, bring some food in the environment, some play as well, and then add a cue. What do you think, Ken and Juliana? No, I, I agree with you. I think that sometimes what happens with those warm-up behaviors is impatient trainers can inadvertently get rid of them. If you're in a hurry to get your dog working and you, you, would, you cue your dog urgently to come over when called, what will happen is they will quit doing that stretch, which is unfortunate because often that's a good warm up for them. So I think allowing them to do whatever they do naturally and then engaging in the session when they're ready sort of keeps those behaviors part of their normal repertoire as opposed to interrupting them all the time because I said, come over here, you know, and you interrupt the, the dog and they quit doing that behavior because you're clearly wanting them to act too quickly. And I think that permission, allowing them to do that is a really helpful thing. Yeah, I love that. Well, and you you gave an example earlier about like being splashed with water is different than like you going in a pool. Yeah. Um, you know, thinking about when our dogs are resting and when they're slowly waking up and allowing them to kind of ease into, do you want food or not? Like with Vito, one of the videos I sent you, Ken, was, you know, he was kind of following me around and waking up a little bit and I was putting his baked, baked wet food treats on the ground. And I'm like, if you eat these, great. If you don't, no problem. You know, we're not going to start a formal training session, but you know, if I'm in a nice deep sleep and my husband bursts in the room and says, Laura, I have a question. I'm going to be like, what? Versus if he slowly comes in the room and says, you know, are you awake and talk softly or maybe just like gently touches my arm. It's kind of easing me into coming out of a deep rest versus I have to, you know, talk fluently right away. It's kind of easing up. What do you think, Juliana? I think that makes total sense. And I really like the I just like how you can expand the concepts during the actual training to throughout your dog's life or a day, whether it's right before the training or at another time where you're being thoughtful about how they're feeling. You're being thoughtful about how you're presenting yourself. You're being thoughtful about the behaviors that they're giving you and the functions of those behaviors. It's, it reminds us that you might think we're talking about cooperative care and husbandry, but the lessons apply the whole throughout the day. You're absolutely right. Hey, you know, I was curious, too. We were talking about the new online version of the DTP and and, you know, we've come around to now doing so much stuff online. Um, but I'm curious as to are, are you both looking forward to teaching the online version and what what challenges do you think that it will present for you? Laura? Oh, I'm definitely looking forward to it. Yeah, um, I learned so much from each of our online student teams so much. I learned so much from their excellent questions, from their video submissions, from our live Zoom chats. I learned so much from the animals that they um, learn with through the program, whether it's their KPA dog um, or their 
they're not, it's not their dog, but they have another dog that they're bringing through the program or the second species training. Yes. And yes. And yes. I can't wait. Looking forward to it. I completely agree. I think it's uh, my favorite part is that we can access just like Laura was talking about earlier students from anywhere. Like, of course we have our time zones, but those are even that as flexible. And for me, I create a lot of relationships online. And so to have people that I've met online say, I'm going through KPA and I'm going to do it with you, even though they're maybe not close to Washington, DC, I think is very, very cool. Yeah. I'm, I'm excited about that as well. I think we've actually had a big, cry for doing the dog trainer professional program online for many, many, many years. And I think uh, we probably would have gotten around to it eventually. But if I if there's anything I can say about COVID, it kind of forced us to figure out what worked and what didn't. And I, I know there are going to be some additional exercises that people who are doing the online version will have to do just to demonstrate certain skill sets. But I think it will be an excellent uh, uh, addition to the different ways that people can take the course. And we're really excited about that. Um, you know, yes, before there's... we run out of time, yeah, oh. go ahead. No, I was going to say, I thought, I think, I think I saw some questions come in and I wanted to see if you wanted to, to take those. Yes. I was going to say, Anna has a great question that I think we can squeeze in before you, we need to wrap well, up. Let's do it. Okay. Anna asks, can you all share your thoughts about feeding during a procedure, assuming a dog will eat versus training operant behavior, then feeding as reinforcement? For example, if you were trying to build duration on the paw soak, would you consider feeding continuously while the paw soaks? What are the pros and cons? Uh, I, I have a lot of thoughts about that. Um, I'll, I'll share my thoughts first. I remember once uh, I had done some, we had gotten a, a really good uh, blood draw on a walrus and I was showing video of this blood draw on this walrus and the needle was in, we were drawing blood and at the front of the walrus, the trainer was feeding, 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 feeding. And I had one of the trainers who was taking this class for me said, that's cheating. She's feeding the entire time. And I said, cheating based on whose criteria. And, uh, and, but I understood what she was saying. She was sort of looking at it from the standpoint of, of, uh, that Anna's looking at it. And I'm not saying that Anna suggested it was cheating, but Anna did suggest, um, you know, some people feel like you train a behavior, you do the behavior and only after the behavior is complete, do you feed. And I find for me, when it comes to medical training, do what works and do what makes your animal feel most comfortable with the walrus because of his size his movement while eating did not affect his back end so his back end stayed perfectly still while the blood was being taken on the other hand if i was working with a sea lion who was very wiggly all the time i might not find it safe to be feeding the animal while that needle was in his backside and i would want that animal to stay totally still until the session was over so i think there's a lot of those different criteria i think that I would feed Marlin while his foot was in the water, especially if you had one of those situations like with our donkeys, sometimes they have a, an abscess in their, in their hoof and they need to be, they need to soak for 20 plus minutes uninterrupted. And while yes, you could train a 20 minute duration foot soak, wouldn't it be easier just to train the animal to get in there and then every minute or so reinforce and vary how often you feed. And so I would feed during that unless I saw that the feeding of the food caused him to get excited and move his foot out of the foot soak bin, then I would change the approach. I would base it on my learner. Laura, different thoughts? That was that was perfect answer. And just to compliment it, and Anna, thank you for the question. Um, in the video that Ken showed of Vito actually doing the chlorhexidine um, paw soak in our backyard. Um, the vet prescribed a five minute duration paw soak. So in the video clip that Ken and Juliana shared, um, I worked on part of the criteria that we're looking at is standing comfortably still. So he was up on the climbs. So, he, so I was not standing over him and I was just slowly feeding him in position while his right rear paw was doing the duration paw soak. But is but just to um just to bridge off of what Ken said too, I was very like I wasn't animated, I wasn't cheering, I wasn't you know like let's play. I was like 
you know, and I'm thinking, and I'm saying, you're such a good boy. We're, you know, we're working on this for five minutes. And I'm also really aware of my position and how I'm delivering food reinforcers to help set Vito up to be comfortably balanced. Juliana. Echo all that. That's great. That's great. Well, thank you, Laura. Thank you so much. I know that uh, you're starting a brand new live course for us next week on uh, cooperative care. I, we didn't talk about it much today because it's sold out. You filled up all the spots for that. Uh, but I know it's because people are very fascinated and interested in learning about uh, uh, about medical care. Um, um, and I want to thank you for being on the program today. And I'm I'm sure we'll invite you back again. This was your fourth visit on live from the ranch. And uh, uh, I'm, I look forward to seeing you maybe next year at another time. And we'll talk about something other than husbandry, perhaps, because you have a lot of other skills that well, I'm uh, that you see can you in Portland. So I'll yeah, see you in Portland. You will. You'll yeah. see me there very, very soon. And keep me updated on that PASO behavior. I sure will. And I want to tell everybody, uh, first of all, I want to invite all of you to join us for a future live virtual group class if you're interested. Uh, although Laura's class is currently full, we have other classes that are coming up. These classes are usually four to six weeks long. They take place on Zoom and they incorporate a well-structured video-based curriculum that guides you each week. And then online discussion groups allow you to ask questions and interact with your uh, fellow students, and then you have a live class where everybody can watch the certain level of 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 of, of students work through the pro the process. And if you want to find out more about some of the upcoming classes, you can go to KarenPriorAcademy.com. Two of the classes that are enrolling right now are on your screen: uh, Raise the Bar with Amber Kwan and Puppy Socialization Live with Scotty Harvey and Dr. Emma Harvey. We also want to remind you that next month we have a very special. Um, uh, broadcast. Uh, Juliana is going to host that one with me. Uh, and we're, instead of being live from the ranch, we will actually be live from Clicker Expo. Uh, Juliana and I will both be there. Please note that the time is different. It is the first Thursday, like always, but instead of 1 p.m. Pacific time, it will be at 3.30 p.m. Pacific time. And we are, are looking forward to that. We'll be actually sitting right next to each other and uh, uh, chatting and maybe even talking to other people who are at Expo as the Expo will just be getting started that evening. So we hope you'll join us April 4th for uh, live from Clicker Expo. If you have other ideas and suggestions or things that you want to share with us, we are always eager to hear those thoughts. You can go to the uh, uh, watch live uh, on the ranch site and uh, there's a, a, a button you can click there to give us suggestions and feedback. We always love hearing from you. And then finally, a reminder to everybody who joined us, here are the offers and the things that we talked about during the broadcast. If you're interested in our dog trainer professional course, uh, you can certainly find out more about that. We certainly want to tell you all about all of our fun events, whether it's Clicker Expo coming up in April or an event here at the ranch throughout the year. And and of course, the live classes are ongoing all the time. We have new classes every single month. So check out our website and found out, find out more. I'm hoping to see all of you at our next Live from the Ranch, which will actually be live from Clicker Expo. Bye-bye, everybody, and happy training.